pressure sores are localized injury to the skin and underlying tissue and it usually occurs over bony areas and it's the result of prolonged unrelieved pressure. There are certain risk factors that put you at risk of pressure sores. So these include friction, impaired sensory perception, where you're unable to feel certain sensations, especially pressure, impaired physical mobility, altered level of consciousness, for example, if you're in a coma, dehydration, elderly patients, and chronic medical conditions like diabetes. So how do pressure sores occur? So whatever the risk factor is, it results in pressure application over soft tissues in a bony area. This pressure will exceed the normal capillary pressure, and what happens is we have occlusion and tearing of small blood vessels, we have reduced tissue perfusion, eventually this leads to ischemic necrosis where the cells and tissues start to die, and then we have the formation of a pressure sore or a pressure ulcer. The common sites of pressure sores include the elbows, the inner knees, the back of the head or the ears, the buttocks and the hip. We can classify pressure ulcers in four different stages and it's always going to be based on the depth of the tissue destroyed. So stage one involves the epidermal layer of the skin. The skin is actually intact but there is redness called an erythema in the area affected and this redness is non-blanchable so when you press it it doesn't turn white. It's usually occurring over a bony prominence. You'll see discoloration of the skin, edema and pain in the area it's important to recognize if the patient is a high risk patient, for example, if they're in a coma, if they're elderly, if they have reduced mobility. So at this stage, it's a key thing to kind of keep an eye out because you can notice the pressure source starting to develop in stage one. Stage two is called partial thickness. An impartial thickness, we have loss of the dermis, there's a shallow open ulcer and there's a pink wound which develops. In stage two, there's damage to the epidermis and the dermis. An ulcer starts to form and it looks like a small blister or an abrasion lesion. Uh, this is stage 2 partial thickness. Stage 3 is when we have full thickness tissue loss. You might be able to see some subcutaneous fat visible. At this stage there isn't any bone or muscle or tendon involvement but you do see subcutaneous fat. Stage 3 involves the epidermis, the dermis and the subcutaneous tissues. Stage 4 is the deepest form of the ulcer, it extends into the muscle, the tendon and the bone and there is full thickness tissue loss. The complications of pressure sores is that it can result in sepsis, bone infections, cellulitis and that's due to infiltration of bacteria into the open wound. So how can you prevent pressure sores? As soon as it's recognized that a person is at risk of developing pressure sores, it's important to relieve the direct pressure and you can do this by changing positions even if you're moving the patient around if it's not yourself that's being affected but make sure there's enough movement to kind of reduce the pressure in that particular area standing up or repositioning the patient regularly at least every two hours you can also get special pressure relieving mattresses and cushions other tips include keeping the skin clean moisturizing the skin thoroughly Moisturizing your skin thoroughly, eating a well-balanced diet, having enough fluid per day, at least two liters, and informing your doctor if you've noticed any skin changes in certain areas. So when ulcerations are present or these pressure sores are present, you can do certain things to help treat it. There are special dressings which are used to protect pressure ulcers and it helps to speed up the healing process. So these can be alginate dressings, hydrocolloid dressings, or it could be a, a sort of foam dressing which can be applied as well. Topical antiseptics or antimicrobial uh, creams aren't really recommended to be honest. The main and most important thing are barrier creams which protect the skin that's been damaged or irritated by the, the high pressure. Antibiotics could be used to treat an infected ulcer or if there is a, a serious infection like sepsis or bacterial infection of the tissues under the skin like cellulitis. Uh, in that case, antibiotics can be prescribed. We've already mentioned eating a healthy and balanced diet is important because that can help speed up the healing process. And the final treatment we're gonna talk about for pressure ulcers is what we do with the, uh, the damaged tissue. So it can be removed in a process called debridement. And this is sometimes necessary to remove the dead tissue, the necrotic tissue to help it heal. 
So you can remove the large amounts of dead tissues in a few ways. You can use ultrasound, surgical instruments like a scalpel and forceps, or high pressure water jets. Local anaesthetic is usually used around the area to numb the area so the debridement is pain free. And the surgery is done to seal the wound to help speed up the healing and minimize the risk of infection. Surgical treatment involves cleaning the wound, closing it by bringing the edges of it together, using tissue from healthy skin nearby to close the ulcer. The problem with pressure ulcers, uh, it can be challenging because the problem with pressure ulcer surgery is it can be challenging because the people who have pressure ulcers developing are usually generally in a poorer state of health. There are risks associated with the surgery and that can include necrosis of the implanted tissue that you, you place in. There is a risk of infection of the bone. Abscesses could develop or even deep vein thrombosis. So that's all we're going to discuss in today's video. Leave a 100 emoji if you've made it all the way to the end. If you do have any questions, leave a comment below and make sure you like, comment and subscribe. Thank you for watching.